Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 411 Ground and Pound MMA podcast, your weekly look into the wide, wacky, wonderful world of mixed martial arts. I'm Robert Winfrey. I am your host for this show whenever you happen to come to it. Uh, We record in the evening, so I tend that's the tense as far as chronological tense I tend to use. Uh, Thank you all very much for being here, for tuning in. However you come to us, whatever your source of podcasting happens to be, uh, they change it. It's not like Apple Music instead of iTunes. So Apple Music, Google Play, Spotify, YouTube, Podcoin, uh, Transistor, whatever. Uh, I don't care that much. I just care that you listen. So thank you. All right, on the docket this afternoon, this evening, whenever you happen to record to find this, a review of last night's UFC on ESPN5. That was uh, an event. Uh, some interesting highs and lows, I think, as far as that event goes, because there was some of all of that. And let's see, then there'll be a preview of next week. UFC is making its debut in Uruguay. Uh, they will be in Montevideo in particular. I need to look up the altitude for that city because it could be close to sea level. It could also be pretty high, depending on... You know, South America has some interesting uh, topography as far as that goes. Uh, the card itself, yeah. Lily. Great top two fights, though. Well, one guaranteed barn burner, one that is interesting in a lot of respects. So We'll go over that, get to news of the week, uh... Not a tremendous amount of news, but a few things did break. And we'll be talking about those in some more specifics. So hopefully you'll... And that's that's what we've kind of got on the docket here this afternoon. And let's jump right into it. I don't need to ramble on too long. Back with me again this week, my regular partner in crime. 411 Mania is jack of all trades because he's in all the zones, folks. Jeff Harris is with us. Jeff, how you doing? Well, I know not to play on the train tracks. Okay, can I just say, I may be a terrible person, uh, and I'll, I'm fine, fine, I'll own that. And I'm not saying anyone should have reacted the way I did, and anyone who was up in arms over it, fine. I'm not going to harp on anyone for how they reacted to what Colby said, but I laughed. I mean, I might, again, I might be a terrible person. I mean, but look, some, some people could argue that Matt Hughes is a terrible person. In some respects, he is. Based uh, on some of his own admission in his book. Yeah. Pretty look, I respect Matt Hughes as one of the greatest fighters of all time, but I mean The ability to separate athletic excellence really terrible things he wrote about what he's done in his book. And this goes beyond like things he said to Tim Sylvia when he trained with Pat Militick. Yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff there. And again, I'm not and let me be clear, that doesn't mean I'm ha- I was not happy when, you know, Matt Hughes got hit by that train or anything. Oh. I, I don't wish a tremendous amount I of harm to honest, him. I hear about that and I hear about, you know, what's been going on in his personal life. I think it's probably head trauma. I would imagine it plays a significant component, especially you know nowadays. He's just he's taken a lot of abuse to the head. But yeah, again, when Colby dropped that line, I'm I'm not gonna lie, I chuckled. I have a dark sense of humor, and again, I might be a kind of a terrible person. So the darker, the darker, the better. But yes. Um, after- and, and 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 look, I mean, look at Robbie Lawler's total non-reaction to that. Uh, well, apparently he couldn't even really hear it, which is kind of a common thing for you being in the cage at that point in time. So he, he so so what if he did? he knows what he said? Come on. Well, now he does. <laughs> I mean, uh, well, I also didn't really expect think, Robbie Lawler to pull a Paul Daly. I, I think very little moves Robbie Lawler beyond maybe his family. Because it, 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 it looks like fighting to barely even moves him either, you know? Yeah, he's pretty. He's a pretty kind of even killed guy these days as far as that goes. So uh, let's jump in. Uh, with like, that is- it says like if you called him a scumbag right to his face and spit on him in his face. He's like, well, I don't know what my opinion on that is. I think you got, okay, hang on. if you actually spit that, on him, he'd probably take your head off. But if you just insulted him, he probably wouldn't care. You know, it's up to you guys to talk about w- what your opinion on that is. I don't really have an opinion on that as probably what he would say. 
I mean, that is what he said when people asked him. On some level, on some level I kind of respect him not trying to get into the whole trash-talking headspace, which he, you know, tends to avoid. Yeah, and you know but, what? If that's what works for him, then, fair, you know, go at for it. At the same time, I kind of get annoyed when he's like, when, when you know... I'm like half annoyed, half in respect of it. As as awkward and contradictory as that sounds, it's. Not, I, I don't find it that contradictory. Uh, but yeah, I, I agree with. I can see why you arrived at that point. Anyway. I guess sometimes it frustrates me, and other times I'm like, all right, good on good on him. He's not like getting wrapped up in all the stupid fighter BS that fighters tend to put forth to kind of make it a spectacle. Yeah. At the same time. For all of the for all of the drawbacks on Colby Covington, I respect what he's doing because he gets it because he gets that trolling gets attention. Yeah, let me. There's a point how that I. Fights, how many title fights do you think Chael Sonnen was in that he probably didn't deserve? Three. And. And look, well, two, and hang on, hang on. Colby sorry, sorry. Went, he legitimately won. I'm not saying Colby is not legit because he is, but Incredibly. but it helps. You cannot deny that it helps, and you cannot deny that the 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 that the media marks out for it. Ariel Hawani, and I'm not trashing Ariel. Ho- you cannot tell me that Ariel Hawani does not lap this kind of stuff up. Uh, I, I mean, I agree with you. Not. Uh, Everyone in the media space laps up this type of stuff Colby is doing. Right. They I mean, for, they, the, the media marks out for it like res, like like wrestling marks do because it's like they're like because there's pearl clutching over it. Everyone's all aghast. Like listen, like did did you hear that post interview post fight interview? Like one of the media members was getting into it with Colby about Donald Trump. And like, do you know Donald Trump is diverting media funds for for the wall in Mexico? And he's That's good. And, okay, okay. I'm not trying to debate politics, but then do you know what Colby said to this reporter? Probably he good. To, he said, like, I'm not gonna go fact for fact with you about politics, but I mean Trump and I were winners. What have you ever won in your life? And then we oh, didn't I, hear from that reporter again. Good for you. I mean look, I don't I don't subscribe to a lot of what Colby does and for when he first started it just completely annoyed me. I I just wanted it to stop. Over his last couple of fights, I've kind of turned a corner on it just a little bit in the sense that, not, again, not that I like it, but watching the rest of the world lose their mind over exactly. what he says exactly. amuses me to no end. But you know what? It's not it's it's not much different from the Chael Sonnen playbook. At I all. Mean, people, people lost their minds over Chael Son, Son, uh, Sonnen's stick. Saying yep. he's being written racist and what and i'm sure colby does believe a lot of it you know on some level agrees and believe but he plays it up he's definitely playing it up to drive people nuts and people and people fall for it because let's be honest robert people are sheep and they like to and they and people like drama people like to get into drama on social media they like to get into it and they like and, and they like to do hot takes and they like to think they're self-important and colby just kind of he's smart and he plays up all that he plays into all of it and he's used it uh really better than over half the roster and he deserves i think he does deserve some credit for that he does yeah i mean he absolutely does and i'm gonna repeat this point because i think it's uh, to the best of my knowledge right now i think it's correct it's something luke thomas has said about colby the presentation of Colby Covington is the monster that the MMA media has created. The way they cover the sport, the way they react to things, someone was going to put it together I mean, and do what he's doing I, to capitalize I mean, on it. But, but the thing is about that, Luke is guilty of it as well. If, to be fair, he admits that. that. He ha- if he says that, he has to acknowledge that he is he is part of that and guilty because he does it too. He, no, he does. Like The times I've heard him say that, he's he's preface that yeah i'm as guilty of this as everybody else so I'm, and i just think it's an, if you don't like if you don't like it if you don't like it i mean it's your it's 
to the people who don't like it in the media, it, it's basically your own fault because you, because the media fuels it, and the media gives less attention to the to the straightforward professional, nice guys who don't want to trash talk. The media, the media want the media favors the spectacle. I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying that's what they do, and I'm saying Kobe navigating it and clearly exact he's clearly exaggerating on some level and playing it up and he's very smart for doing this like ariel hawani on one occasion uh when they stripped covington of the title or they said they were going to strip him because they were because they ended up booking i think woodley versus Till. like ariel hawani i think went on his show i think it was the mma hour and he basically lost it and he was like, he could have been the first UFC fighter to visit the White House and Donald Trump. How could they do this? Da, da, da. And then he ended up visiting the White House anyway with Donald Trump. And everyone was like, congrats, Ariel, you, you played yourself. My point is, my point is he was like, Ariel Hawani was going nuts. Like, like nuts over, the, uh, over this idea that, that, Co- that we thought Covington was going to visit the White House and because... They were stripping of him of the interim title. It looked like that was no longer on the table. Right? I remember vaguely a bit bits of that being so, discussed, yeah. So I'm saying I'm saying the pro wrestling stick, when you play it like the shtick, when you play it like this, the way Colby's doing in MMA, it works massively. Massively. And when you look at the results last night, you cannot deny it, Robert. No, I, I, I mean, there's, I think this, and I'm going to quote, I believe this is Ben Folks uh, who said this, so I'm hoping to, I believe this is the correct attribution. If not, I apologize profusely. This is, I'm not presenting this as my own thing. But what, what, one of the things that makes Colby work is the fact that he executes such a familiar and not terribly difficult gimmick, but he does it so awkwardly that it only makes things, that it only magnifies the intended effect. Now the audience hates him for being so hateable, but we also kind of hate him for being bad at being hateable. <laughs> then we remember that by hating him at all, we're playing into his hands, and that makes us hate him even more. And I, I think that's a lot. I think that's a very apt uh, synopsis of the cycle uh, again, kind of the the you know the circle and cycle that is that Colby's trying to exploit. And in fairness to Colby, he's not the first guy to do it this way. He's not going to be the last. Ronda did it too. Ronda did it. Uh, yeah, Chael Sonnen did it. Conor McGregor's done it at points. Yeah, I mean, it wor- they do it because it works. Yeah, when it do- when it stops working, people will stop. When it stops working, the people who are either affecting it or just or or um, because again, I believe you know, I believe there's elements of what Colby says that are in tune with who he is as an actual person. He just yeah. plays it up, which again, it's fair play. Hard. For Chael Son. I mean, it worked for him tremendously. It backed him into the title. He's not shows. getting paid six figures to be doing his his YouTube stuff and his ESPN stuff at least a year. I don't. I would Plus, I would imagine that's probably about low, what he makes? He's got to be making six figures, possibly clearing low low seven a year, easy at this point. You would think, right? It wouldn't shock me at all. In Considering and, and and let's look at Shale. I mean, let's look at Shale Sonnen's record, his actual MMA record. It was fairly mediocre in, in numerically. His final MMA record was thirty-one, thirty-seven, and one. Really, he had a losing every, record at the end. Lost every UFC title fight of his career. You know, wasn't really. I mean, yeah, he did beat he did beat some good fighters. Had the- again, the crazy thing about Sonnen is he has competed against some of the genuinely elite guys of his era, and he's beaten a fair number now, of them. Now, now you could argue. Now, now let's look at Colby. You could argue Colby is even better as a welterweight than than Sonnen was at the peak of his career. So, for Colby to be as good as he is and to be doing it, he ha- he has potential to get even farther than Sonnen does. Don't you agree? Yeah, uh, yeah. If we're talking I mean, about his incageability, yeah, Colby's a better fighter than Chael. As much as you consider, as much as you consider the interim title, I mean, whatever. Hey, he's got one more title win than Chael does. Exactly. So, 
and, and he's only lost once. So I think he he is one of the smartest fighters in the UFC right now. He real he is. And here's the other thing about there's two things I think that kind of I don't know how much I don't want to get into chicken or egg about which you know came first, but a significant amount of the fandom, and I imagine a fair number of other fighters tend to diminish his in cage abilities because of that shtick. I mean, it, it, maybe. Well, I, 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 we've probably done it too, but we did both pick him to win this fight. We did. I, uh, I mean, in, again, I have picked against him when I shouldn't have, and I, in fairness, I did score the, I did score him losing the RDA fight. He Full didn't, disclosure. He, didn't, he wasn't as active in that fight as he was here, though. No, no. Well, and RDA did a this better job a of. I think we have to credit Colby because last night was a much better performance. And I think both the Maya and the RDA fights, I think. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, that does kind of let me, as far as the actual fight itself, uh, Colby main event, Colby Covington defeats Robbie Lawler via unanimous decision, 50-44, 50-45, 50-45. I don't agree with 50-44. Right. I, I agree. I, I don't know which round. Well, he could... did have a couple moments throughout the he, he did have some moments throughout the fight. But yeah. what if I told you that Lawler, I felt he did it like he gets very passive sometimes. He's and he waits too long to pull the trigger. And I felt like he did it last night. Am I wrong? He did it a, he did it a lot last night. And he's done and, and the reason I mentioned this, he has a habit. He has a habit of doing this his entire career. He kind of he kind of just takes rounds off or it looks like he's wait, he's waiting for that right moment, and when he's waiting for that like moment to 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 either pull the trigger and just unleash a barrage and go berserk, or he's waiting for that one shot and then he's just he's lost half the fight by that point, you know? Yeah, there was definitely a bit of that. Um, I, I want to again. I do want to kind feel of like do- we saw it in the first in in the fights with Hendrix, um, somewhat with. Carlos Condit, which I think you scored for Condit, as I, I did, and I stand by that. In fairness, all right, and, and I think it's fair. I think it's fair. I mean, I think that was a close fight. I think both the fights were with Hendricks were close. And to be quite frank, I scored the first fight with Hendricks for Lawler, and I and I, I almost kind of felt Hendricks. I kind of leaned toward Hendricks in the second fight. To be to be frank, now, I I believe when I scored their rematch live, I scored it for Hendricks. I'd have to go back into my archives. but I would too, but I mean, I, I thought both of those fights were close fights. They were. Uh, yeah, but they I, were close fights. My problem is is that he, that Lawler, he gets too passive. And yeah, and he... And Covington's pace last night was relentless. He that was, was an absurd pace. Constantly, constant aggression, constantly moving forward and just um, giving Lawler everything he had, um, and I yeah. think that could that could be pro- that could be problematic for Kamaru. I'm still it p- could. It pr- provided that fight happens, I'm still picking Kamaru Usman. Um, but if he can maintain a pace like that against Kamaru, it could be pr- it it could give Kamaru trouble. We have to yeah. know that. Yeah. For the record, for those of you who may not have heard this, um. Colby last uh, last night last, uh, uh, when he fought Robbie Lawler attempted 533 strikes over the course of that five round fight. That's I believe that mathematically averages out to one strike every 2.8 seconds. That is a crazy pace. That's a, again, it's if you want to do if instead of going second by second, if you want to go round by round, that's a hundred strikes per round. 100 strikes every five minutes. That is nuts for guys significantly lighter than he is. You know, Max Holloway can keep that pace. I expect you know Max can maybe keep that pace. Not, but he's one of the few featherweights that can. I don't think Frankie could keep that pace. And you know, respect to Frankie as a fighter, but I think that's a pace that he might not be able to maintain over five rounds. It, uh. You know, Brian Ortega probably couldn't keep that pace. You know, I mean, that's not necessarily well, Ortega's bag the anyway. Thing is both guys tend to not they they tend to be decision makers. 
they tend to not be fi- they tend to not finish fights. That's why I think Covington playing up his personality was smart because look, Shale Sonnen wasn't the most Sonnen's fights are not that interesting. <laughs> like if you just if all you do is play if if you take out all the pre-fight stuff, all the pre-fight packages, if all you do is watch a Chael Sonnen fight from the start to the finish, they're not that interesting. And I'm not saying Colby is one-dimensional, but I'm saying Colby has a certain style where if you're an MMA fan who's all about the finishes, he tends to not be the one to finish fights. No, he's not a big finisher. He doesn't have a tremendous amount of power, and his wrestling style does not lend itself as readily towards finding control positions for submissions the same way others do. But but it kind of made like his whole personality and his shtick, it makes up, it makes up for that a lot. Like it did with Shell song. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. And he and Kamar. Okay. Can I just say this? That again, after the fight, he wins. Both guys kind of say their piece. His confrontation with Kamaru Usman on the analyst desk was hilariously bad. They both immediately both, both start. Both of them came off badly to me. Yeah, yeah, again, both of them. Like, I'm. Let me be clear about this. And here's there, there's a couple of reasons that this kind of stuff just grates on my nerves. There's a bunch of security there, so they both know nothing's going to happen. So they get to posture. Moreover. I think if you took them and you just, you know, if they ran into each other in a hotel room or excuse me, like passing in a hotel without cameras, neither of them would jump. But but the fact, but the funniest part of that whole thing is that guys were standing behind them and wrapping their arms around their legs. They they had security there. That visual was hilarious to me. Yeah, they had security there very deliberately. So in case something's stupid happened nothing really escalated and the presence of that security meant that both of them could kind of do the hold me you know the hold me back but oh let me go bro kind of thing and it's yeah it's just it's profoundly annoying i mean whatever else you want to say about you know someone like habib or jorge masvidal or even connor to an extent if they you if you really kind of get in their face, they're going to do something. They, they're they not really – they don't just posture to posture. That's a giant waste of everyone's time. And there was a lot of posturing between those two in that respect. And we're going to get however many months of buildup between the two it's of them. good because, again, the MMA media eat, eat, eat it up, fans eat it up, and – you, you have the ultimate – now you have, for a lot of people, the unless you're a Trump supporter, you have the ultimate bad guy in Colby Covington. And now you have, you know, the, you know a guy who's basically fulfilled the American dream in Kamara Usman. Yeah, an immigrant uh, – a legitimate immigrant who has reached athletic excellence and is, yeah, living the American dream. You get to – and uh, yeah, I, the, I really the, profoundly the democratic side of the equation, like Kamaru Usman is even more of a hero, you know, so it works. It works every which way. Yeah. And I'm sure it will be framed that way by everybody who with, you know, the ability to gobble up free clickbaity articles or those who are going to pat themselves on the back for drawing socially relevant, quote unquote, parallels. And which that, that's exact, but but Robert, that is exactly why Covington should be doing because guys are going to do that. They are, and in fa- and again, Covington knows. I, I believe he knows this. It would be very easy for him to get lost in the shuffle if he's not the character that he is, because if he's not saying the things he's saying, okay, he beat Robbie Lawler, very impressive win especially the way he did it. If you look at the substance of the fight, profoundly impressive on many, many levels. He almost did get lost in the shuffle. He was very close. Yes. He was moving on without him. Yeah, and I mean, again, if he's not the, char- the character bordering on caricature that he is, 
Everyone right now is talking about Jorge Masvidal. And with good reason, mind you. Jorge's done some pretty impressive things over the last over his last couple of fights. But so I Colby is very aware of you know his position and how best to kind of maximize it so he doesn't get lost in the shuffle. And you know what? Again, fair play. The UFC is not a pure meritocracy. It never has been uh, throughout the, the totality of its existence. And if and this is the game. And Colby's figured out a way to play it that has worked historically and is working for him I, right now. But I think we do need to give him credit because this was a this was a big win for him, which he he needed because I think he was I think he was out for too long. Yeah, he was out. He he was out for a while. I don't, I don't know how serious his injuries were and if he really needed to be out as long as he did. Because let's see, his last – this was his first fight since – Since the RDA fight. Yeah, and that was, but that was June 2018. He really needed to prove why he needs to be in the title picture. Yeah, um, I, I imagine a bit of the nece- you know how necessary was his surgery would be depend would depend on how badly deviated his septum was in that case. Because if it's bad, then yeah, get that fixed. Otherwise, yeah. otherwise that opens up a whole but host. I, I mean, of I'm not a doctor, problems. and I don't know. I don't know. And, and and like you know, to me, a deviated septum doesn't sound like a torn ACL or or whatever, or a torn labrum, or internal de- whatever. I don't know, but. He needed to get back in there and to show why he should be in the title picture. And he hasn't lost since the Worley Alves fight, which was a uh, couple of years ago, right? No, that was in t- December 2015. So about almost, four years, almost four years. So three and a half at this point, if nothing else. So like he has a he has a great record, all things considered. He has a strong UFC record. He has an exceptional UFC record, yeah, yeah. actually. You know, now, looking at Robbie Lawler, I think you do have to drop him down the rankings now. And here's yeah, this this was three in a row, right? I don't know if it was. Yeah, this is his third in a row. So let so let's look at the rankings. So Lawler now is at welterweight. Oh, he's number eleven now. He, he was, was number 11 going into this. Okay, practice. actually, you know what? The, all right, so the rankings were the rankings were fair, I think, pretty fair in this case. He had dropped all the way down to 10. So this, this loss could even drop him further, basically. So this is one case, Robert, where I think the rankings have it right, have it fairly accurate. Yeah, I didn't have a real problem with him at 11. He'll probably be closer to 15 after this or just out of them altogether, which I can also live with. I'd be, I'd be fine if he's just uh, like lower and lower in the top 15. Yeah. Uh, but my point is when you lose three in a row, like you shouldn't be in the top five anymore. And sometimes I feel like the rankings would keep guys in the top five, even though they've lost like three or like, two out of, or three out of four, da, da, da. You know what I mean? They have in the past. Sometimes I, I feel like the rankings people are too afraid to take guys out of the top 15, and I think I think that's a problem. Well, and the, I also imagine the majority of them are just not very good at their jobs when it comes to, like, if well, you look at the people I, contributing I, to that. I, I don't want to go that far because it's averages. So, so again, you have a few people from you know an FM radio station in Tulsa who are just screwing everything up. I mean, I mean, it could be, but we've seen a lot. Or, of- oh god, or the Brazilians. Good grief! You remember when they first debuted these rankings? If you looked up, because they would show the individual. Mm-hmm. If you wanted to, you could look up the you know what the the rankings they aggregated from. The oh, Brazilian yeah. rankings were just hor- so wildly nationalistic that it wasn't even funny. Yeah, now I don't think you can look it up by outlet. You no. Used, in, in, the old, in the old site format, you used to be look up, you, excuse me, uh, you used to be able to look up the rankings based on the outlet and who was ranking them, right? Yeah, you could, you, when they, they would present, you know, say the welterweight rankings and then right. they had a, another thing you could click on that would show oh, you. Oh, you still can. Oh, you still can, nice. You, they still have a rankings uh, panel. 
Oh, good for that. Yeah. I might have to start looking at that more thoroughly to dissect some of the morons who submit to Let's it. See. So, um, but the panel looks very small, though. It is. They've shrunk oh, it. From, it, it's, it has not expanded at any point in its existence. It has only contracted. All right. So there is that. So there's that. So maybe, I don't know how, I'd have to take a closer look to see how much it's improved, if at all. Uh, but these are some certain steps, at least. Um, now, if I were to ask you, what would you rather see, Usman versus Masvidal or Usman versus Covington? What do you think should happen? Oh, man, that's rough. That's, that's a genuinely tough thing because there's a valid case to be made for either guy. Which one I would personally rather see? I'd rather see Jorge Masvidal. Just from a fight standpoint... From an action standpoint, I'd probably rather see Usman versus Masvidal to see if Masvidal can give Usman any problems with his power. But I would still, I would still favor Usman there, and I would still favor Usman over Covington. Yeah, they're, they're different. They're different type of matchups. From an entertainment standpoint, I I would prefer the Masvidal matchup for sure. So, yeah, again, and that's really all it can kind of come down to because they both have very, very valid meritocratic claims. So which would I personally rather see? I'd rather see Jorge get the shot. But, eh, again, that's just me, and that's not because I dislike Colby at all, necessarily. I'm not looking for an excuse to say, no, Colby should never fight for the belt. No, Colby has a very good claim to fight for the belt. I, But if you know, it's me choosing between those two... It's probably Jorge. If you put Colby and say any other welterweight, no, it's Colby. Absolutely. Well, again, my problem, Colby's, Colby waited for a long time. Yeah, he had a long, he was out for a while. And some of it was self-imposed, and we can't deny that. No, I, uh, some of it was, yeah, some of it was. Because I, I heard he was getting the, the septum surgery like back last fall, wasn't he? I no, don't know was when it was like done. A year, like a year ago. Let's see if I have a list about when that was. I don't know. I don't know if this is true. Apparently, he was offered the fight with Woodley earlier this year. Yeah, I, I remember that. So, was he still injured then? Um, that was weird. That was a weird thing because um. Now again, that could be just Dana White promoter speak, but I don't know. Yeah, I I know they had kind of wanted to do that. Uh, again, late last you know, in 2018, but uh, Colby yeah. had a thing, and then I think Woodley had a thing. Look, Usman had rightfully earned a uh, a shot at the title as well because yeah. Covington was not. He was there. He became interim champion, and then he kind of just sat out for a long time. And I think that's his fault. That's his loss. But now he's back in there, and that's kind of why I wouldn't really mind if Masvidal was given a title shot because Masvidal has constantly been taking those fights yeah i don't think you can go wrong with either of them you know they're both they've both earned it again meritocratically they both present interesting questions uh for kamar usman to answer yep and i would again i would lean towards usman over both of them but i would not be shocked if either of them beat him either all right, I so, think we can move on to the co-main event now. And that was your main event. Um, the co-main event didn't last long, but uh, Jim F. and Miller. Are we really surprised, though? Um, no. You know, as, as the as the as this fight got closer and closer, the more I kind of thought, you know what, Miller's got a really good guillotine. Has and it, hasn't Guida been guillotined in the first round like quite a bit? Um, you need a really good one to really catch him, but because I think Oliveira, it's only, Oliveira did it. Because Oliveira did it, yeah. Last and, year, I mean, when they as soon as they announced that fight, I said Guida's going to shoot a double, Oliveira's going to guillotine, and we're going to be done. Tiago Tavares did it. Yeah, uh, down at featherweight, Tiago Tavares did it. So in the last several years, he he gets guillotine choked in the first. That's like the goatee thing. It, Miller, some, Oliveira, Tiago Tavares. 
it's something about the way he shoots his double leg. He keeps his head on the outside, but he doesn't... Um, He's not really good about getting his hips and his torso kind of past the guard, even as you're falling down. And I'll give him a, I will give him a minor pass in this one just because Miller had cracked him so badly with that left that he was, oh, crap, double leg, because that's what he goes to every look, time he's hurt. I'm, I'm a big Jim Miller fan, Robert. But I mean, look, this was a this was a gimme win to get, you know, let him look good at, at home, basically. Um, it was a very winnable fight for him, yes. If this is a higher level fight, I don't know if he can beat anyone in the top 15 at this point. Oh, the, the top 15 at lightweight? No, no. I Again, I like Jim Miller. I have a l- tremendous amount of... Has he ever fought Oliveira? I think yeah, twice. Okay. Uh, several years ago, he knee-barred Charles Oliveira. Then in their rematch, Oliveira choked him out. All right. Um, no, I don't think he can hang with the top 15 at lightweight. I mean, number 14 is Dan Hooker, who knocked him out badly. Right. Uh, Gillespie, I, I don't think he beats Gillespie. No, uh, again, there's no one in the top 15 I think he beats. Uh, and, I, again, I like Jim Miller. I He has been part of some of my favorite fights. He's had some of my favorite moments. I mean, and, his first and, fight with— And you know what? He looked good. He looked— I don't know what it is. He grew his hair out a little bit, but he looked he, he looked totally different. It was weird. I almost didn't recognize him last night. A change of hairstyle will do that on occasion, yeah. And he was uh, talking he, about that at the post-fight show. He, he's like, doing kind of what Dustin Poirier did. And I'm like, man, you grow your hair out just a little bit, but I don't know. Uh, Dustin Poirier did kind of the same thing. You know, He went from always having the, you know, the shaved head to... Yeah. It could just be clean living. It could be good genes. I know he had... Um, he, fi- he is finally kind of over the Lyme disease that he's he struggled with for a really long time. Yeah. I mean, Lyme disease it's, is nasty. Is Lyme disease curable? Or is oh, it yeah. Curable? Okay. It's, it's curable. It's just it can take a while to detect sometimes. Okay. Well, he's had it... He had it diagnosed quite a while ago. So he's fought through that. And Lyme disease or not, I just don't see him being like a relevant contender again. No, I, at but this point in his career, fights like this. But if he wants, but eh, we'll see. No, at this point in time, no, he's not a top guy in terms of you know com- pure competitiveness. Uh, it, it's you know he's just too long in the tooth. He's thirty-five years old at lightweight. I mean, I mean, that said, again, Miller's name is plastered across the record books. He's got the most appearances in UFC history. He's got the most wins. I'm sure in at some point, based on his stats and history, you can find some sort of obligatory Hall of Fame category for him. Well, he's now joined the 20, win, 20 UFC win club, which is a very exclusive club. Um, the only guys... I think it's um, Cerrone has 23, Damian Maya has 21, GSP and Bisbing both have 20. And I think he's the other guy with rounds. Excuse me, he's been fighting there for almost 11 years. So that's, I mean, to stick around in the UFC 11 years is still a pretty strong feat. Yeah. So he's joined an elite club there. He has the most, he's now tied for most finishes in lightweight history with uh, Joe Lozon, I believe. He's again got most wins in the division history. It's he, the man's a workhorse, and has had a again a, lo, a type of longevity that is shocking in some respects. Uh, and you know, it, seeing him win, you know, it's always a feel good moment kind of thing. So yeah, you know, again, do I see him you know challenging the elite of the division? No, I don't, and. That I mean, and you got this Guida get choked out last night, which I'm sure put a smile on your face. Guida going to sleep is always a good thing. Right. I don't, I don't really think we need to really cover fight by fight. We, I think we can just run down the rest. of Yeah, this. I, I don't think there's anything else that's. Wow, really? They gave Shevchenko and Pudilova fight of the night. That's bizarre. All right. Uh, Nasrat Hakparast defeated uh, Joachim Silva via knockout in the second round with punches. 
Uh, Hack Press is pretty legit. Um, I know everyone makes the mini Gastelum joke, and there's a reason for it. There's a pretty striking resemblance physically and in, and stylistically. But dude needs to be paid attention to. Um, Gerald Mershart submitted, uh, beat Trevin Giles via technical submission in the third round with a guillotine. Really nice power guillotine from Mershart. I, I was very fond of the transition he hit to grab that. That was a really slick bit of grappling from him. Um, shame that Trevin Giles seems to have such continuous lapses of judgment in the cage because he's got some tools. But uh, deciding to just grapple more with Gerald Mershart when you're not as good a grappler as he is, eh, maybe not the best decision. Scott Holtzman defeated Dong Hyun Ma via doctor stoppage between rounds two and three. Good stoppage. Ma's left eye was completely shut. Like, you, you just got to stop that. But it was a fun little bit of brawl while it lasted, as most of Ma's fights are. In your worst fight of the evening, and one of the worst fights of the year, Kennedy and Zechiku defeated Darko Stasic via unanimous decision, 29-26, 29-26, 28-27. I don't agree with 29-26 because it means you gave Zechiku the third round, which I don't believe you can... I don't think you won the round. Um, Stasic was deducted because... Of, for those of you wondering what the odd scores are about, Stasic was deducted a point in the second round for his second time kicking in Zechku in the crotch, and then again in the third round for, again, another groin strike. I wasn't a big fan of the first point deduction, so the one from the second round, because it... Uh, it I mean, he'd already kicked him low once, but the first time he got warned, it was mostly on him and not being properly in control of his weapon. The second time, it was much more... Just a lot of bad timing and a really unfortunate confluence of events. Uh, the one in the third, fine. You know that the point deduction there was absolutely warranted. So it was a terrible fight, and Zechiku shouldn't be in the UFC. He's not a UFC caliber fighter. He's had two fights; they've both sucked. Can we not do this anymore, please? Um, Mickey Gall defeated Salim Tuari via unanimous decision, 29-28 across the boards. Um, I think there's an argument for scoring this one for Tuari. Uh, it just, it comes down to the third round. The other two rounds were pretty clear. And Gall, I think, just kind of, uh, you know, arguably stole it at the end of that round. Um, eh, not a great fight, but you know, it involves Mickey Gall, so what do you expect? And Tuari is now 0-3, I believe, in the UFC and probably shouldn't be there. Antonina Shevchenko defeated Lucia Pudilova via technical submission. Rear naked choke in the second round. You know, for what this was, this was all right. Um, Shevchenko has some pretty wicked knees in the clinch. Uh, Pudilova landed a couple of decent elbows. But uh, Pudilova tried a really... She was going for, a, I think, a high crotch lift. But didn't re but uh, Pudilova had, or excuse me, but Shevchenko had reached around her and had her hips offset uh, in such a way that when the takedown was completed, uh, Shevchenko wound up on her knees rather than on her hips or her butt, and was able to throw a, I believe her left leg over to get full back mount and lock up the choke. Uh, again, it was a nice transition, and and uh, if you watch Pudilova go for that takedown in the second. Now, study it because there's a few things she does very wrong that a lot of people try, you know, kind of do as well. So you know, learn a few things you know, not to do. Good example of that. Um, Matt Schnell defeated Jordan Espinoza via triangle choke at 123 of the first round. Schnell's guillotine choke threat into the triangle is a really slick submission setup. Uh, he hit, I believe, Louis Gaudino with it in his last fight. Or, excuse me, Smolka. Not Gowden, no. It's even more impressive on Smolka, considering what a good grappler Smolka is. Uh, it, it, it's a really slick thing. And, you know, if you're going to keep Flyweight around, he's a good guy to have. And uh, so, a yeah, good win for him. Um, Lauren Murphy defeated Mar Romero Barella via knee and elbows. TK won the third round. Not much of, not a whole lot of interest up until the finish. Um, Murphy just stuffs a bad double leg, 
breaks Barella's posture as she's getting up and knees her in the jaw. And that's basically all she wrote. Claudio Silva submitted Cole Williams via rear naked choke in the first round, two minutes, 35 seconds. Claudio Silva, sadly forgotten in the welterweight division, uh, just because of that long layoff he had when he dealt with a bevy of foot injuries, both to his right and left. But Silva's really good. And uh, I know Williams took this on short notice and, just wound up getting kind of steamrolled and kicking everything off. Miranda Granger defeated Hannah Goldie via unanimous decision 30, 27 across the boards. This was just not a very interesting fight. I don't know what else to tell you. All right, Jeff, any burning desires from that last group of fights? Anything stick out in your mind? Nope. Alrighty. That was UFC on ESPN five. Again, some highs, some lows and, Again, at the end of the day, just not a terribly compelling card. Again, co-main event, great feel-good moment. Main event, very, very relevant fight. Other than that, we had a few decent fights, a few decent finishes, but eh, nothing that I think is really going to feature too prominently in my mind even, you know, two weeks from now. But eh, we'll see. All right, this coming Saturday, we will have UFC on ESPN plus 14. Uh, or Fight Night 156, uh, again, their debut in Uruguay. And the main event, Valentina Shevchenko defending the flyweight, women's flyweight title against Liz Carmouche. This is a rematch. Liz Carmouche defeated Shevchenko a few years ago via doctor stoppage due to a cut. I believe that was Valentina's first loss. Yeah, Valentina has only lost to Liz Carmouche and Amanda Nunes. So there, so yeah, uh, Valentina, very good fighter. Um, Jeff, is there any reason I, to pick Liz Carmouche here? On paper, from a logic standpoint, I just can't in good conscience do it. I mean, she's a veteran, she's been in there with. A lot of tough opponents, but I feel like she's lost every every one of the biggest fights of her career. Um, you know that's probably that's probably true, actually. I mean, even at flyweight, she's only two and one. Yeah, and her wins are over Jennifer Maya and Lucia Pudilova, who are. Well, let's see. Let's see what she did after the Rousey fight. She beat all right. She beat Jessica Andrade. Um, that was, you know, that was when Andrade was fighting at a phantom weight. Right. Um, after that, she lost to Alexis Davis and Misha Tate. And look, Davis did go on to fight for the title next, whether that's notable or not. Uh, Tate eventually became champion. OK. Um, beat Lauren Murphy and Caitlin Chukagi. And then I feel like. She hasn't been all that active either. Let's see. She fought once in 2015, once in 2016, once in 2017. So this is the first time she's had two fights in a year since 13. Since 2000. That's that's a little crazy to me. That yep. she's been so inactive. And has that been due to injuries or just UFC booking? I am. I don't think any, if it's been injuries, it's not been, you know, major high publicized injuries. I don't know if it's booking. I don't know if it's just minor injuries because it's entirely possible that she just, you know, I don't see anything Carmouche has done or has ever done giving Shevchenko problems. If Carmouche is able to consistently out wrestle Shevchenko, I think she has an, that's her avenue to victory. Shevchenko doesn't do badly against wrestlers and grapplers, though, I think. She does not, and Shevchenko can I wrestle. I feel. But, I mean, that could be one area. Uh, again, I think if Shev- if Carmouche can get on top and pass guard, and she's a decent passer, that's where she that's her only kind of real shot at winning because she's not a very heavy puncher on the feet. She's not really... 
a cardio machine as far as that goes, who just will wear you down with pace. This is her first five-round fight since the Rousey fight. Is Carmouche even that good of a wrestler? For mm. women's MMA, yes. I guess in terms of her MMA, but I mean, I mean, her record's only 13-6. and six. Yeah, I, I, I don't have... I don't have much of a reason to pick against Valentina Shevchenko here. And... One, two, three. She has six UFC wins to four UFC losses. To me, that's not that impressive. Uh, it's not. And she's only getting this title shot by virtue of the fact she fought Ronda Rousey uh, for the UFC title before, and she has two wins at flyweight. That's basically why she's getting this shot. Um, and I think largely her availability for probably, this card. Probably. Carmouche has a bit of a, I mean, she has a bit of a name. She's not a big name, but she has some name value, um, and experience in you. And, and look, Carmouche is a good person. I mean, she's, re- she's clearly reliable and she can handle, she can handle herself in these type of situations. So. I don't necessarily mind this decision. Um, so good, I mean, good for her. Yes, I mean, I mean, just to say she can fought, uh, she fought for the UFC title in two different weight classes against such big names is, you know, it's going to be pretty big for her les- legacy, even though she won't be champion. Yeah, I am again. I have a really hard time picking her here. It's just. <laughs> I have a hard time picking a I, lot of people. She might give Shevchenko a couple problems. Look, I mean, she almost submitted Ronda. She, almost uh, got, she got a good position against Ronda. I don't know that that submission was all that close. Yeah. And I mean, again, there's things Carmouche does well, but I just, at this point, I struggle to see her finding this type of sustained success against I mean, Valentina that you need. Look what she did to Jessica I. She kicked her in the head <laughs> after dominating her for the first round. That was... Uh, and I had three three straight wins at flyweight. I mean, at least two of those were split decisions, and one of them I thought she lost, but... Yeah. Valentina is a scary woman. Did you see her response when Henry Cejudo said, you know, there's another flyweight bit of gold I'd like to collect? No, what, it, what was it? She says, my flyweight belt is always defended by my Glock. Uh, <laughs> like, buddy, you... Uh, uh, again, if they were to actually fight in the that, cage, yeah, that Henry would probably mean win. She's carrying heat wherever she goes. Wherever she can, legally, I think. I mean, she's a nearly competitive level shooter. Have you seen... Uh, she's put out some of the... I mean, you know, some clips of her, you know, doing shooting training. I mean, I can't... I can't just... <laughs> I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna stay silent here. <laughs> uh, Look, man, yeah, you, you don't want that. I, I would not want to go near her and try to take her title, and I would not want to upset her. Let me just say that much. Valentina's a again a very talented woman and an incredibly scary one under most circumstances. <laughs> yeah, she like, she's a really good shooter. Again, she does competition stuff and is apparently quite skilled at it. So. Yeah, when she says, yeah, "Please come near my, yeah, come near my title, and I've got a Glock for you," she means that. <laughs> I, I, it always amuses me that when people talk about, you know, MMA fighters, well, the people that are packing Glocks too. Well, it, it amuses me just when people talk about, you know, different fighters and some of the tattoos that they have. You know, kind of, you know, rep, you know, right. talking about, you know, how tough they. I mean, you know, Tiago Santos has that big sledgehammer tattooed on his chest. Et cetera, et cetera. I don't know how many of you have, have just not noticed this, but Valentina literally has a tattoo of a Glock on her hip. That is not a woman to screw around with. So, yeah, I, I think she'll win this fight, but, you know, she's fluent in Spanish. She lives, I believe, in uh, Peru at the moment. I think that's where her primary residence is. So she's uh, native enough to the area to potentially draw some interest that way. And uh, you know what? Uh, it's, a, it's a perfectly acceptable main event. And, you know, the co-main event's pretty darn good, too, as far as this goes. We have Mike Perry and Vicente Luque. 
Uh, Luke, a, a, a terribly underappreciated UFC fighter. He's only got two losses in the UFC, and his only loss since 2015 is to Leon Edwards, who's, you know, top five guy right now. Uh, he's on a five-fight winning streak, I think. Yeah, and he's finished all of those. And Mike Perry, you know, is Mike Perry. <laughs> He has those kind of wild and crazy brawls. He's got heavy hands. He's willing to engage. This is a really solid co-main event for this kind of card. I'm, I I like that as a co-main event. I like Luke's chances uh, fairly heavily, actually. But I think it's it's a it's pretty it's as kind of close to guaranteed fireworks as you're going to get on the rest of this card. So uh, I like Luke there, but that should be a pretty decent fight. So uh, Luke versus Perry. I'm picking Luke. Perry's a very. I don't think he has a very high fight IQ, Robert. No, he's a very, and I mean this. I mean, look, this is a. He's he is you know the Florida man fighter. I think he's talented. I think he's he's good. He has he has clear skills, and he's. He's dangerous at times, but I don't think he makes smart decisions in the cage a lot, and he does it a lot. Yeah, he's again. He tends to do what he's going to do, and that's and he doesn't really change it, you know, from opponent to opponent. All right. As for the rest of this card, we don't even have a fully finalized bout order yet, do we? Uh, because yeah. there's. Because there's a few of these fights that have been remade, and so their order on the back card has been shuffled. Um, you know, we can probably just do quick hits for the rest of these. There's not a lot here to really get into. I agree. Uh, we have a fight between Umberto. There's going to be a lot of the South, the you know, the usual suspects for the South American contingent, such as Umberto Bandene, whose UFC record is one and two on a two-fight losing streak, and he lost to Arston Arnett, who is not good enough to be in the UFC. Kind of ergo, Bandene really shouldn't be in the UFC. He's fighting Luis um, Garagori. Where's he from? Oh, he's actually from Uruguay, so he's the local guy. Um, there might be a slightly different accent on the double R's then. Or even the G's. Geez, I'm not entirely sure how on the accents on Uruguayan Spanish. Uh, he's on a good winning streak. He's never lost. He's 12-0. and 0. Uh, And that's kind of a softball for your UFC debut, because, again, Bond and I shouldn't be in the UFC. So I, I think that's smart matchmaking as far as you know, making the local crowd happy. Um, Vulcan Uzdemir will fight Ilir Latifi. Why? Just why? I mean, Uzdemir... Uzdemir's one of those guys who I think is going to wind up going down as, boy, he was on, he debuted and we had a rocket ship and, boy, that thing just blew up in the atmosphere. Because uh, he's on a three-fight losing streak. And, sure, one of those was to Daniel Cormier and then Anthony Smith and then Dominic Ray. It's, I don't know. I don't know, man. This is a tough one. Because Latifi's not exactly a world beater either. I'll go with Uzdemir, but that's probably a very, very stupid decision. Um, Adolfo Vieja, all five and zero of him. Um, sorry, I shouldn't say that because Vieja is, for those unaware, an absolute jujitsu savant. The man is one of the best uh, jujitsu practitioners of the last, you know, ten years. Multiple gold medals at uh, world cha- at the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu World Championships. Multiple gold medals at the World Cup. Uh, he's won the, at ADCC. He's won- taken gold at the Pan American Games. The man is a Jiu-Jitsu wizard. Uh, an absolute le- again a legend in the Jiu-Jitsu community. Uh, he's also just kind of unfortunately wound up in. 
Uh, he's moved on from that again. Now he's fighting. This is his UFC debut. He's 5-0. and oh. I think he fought twice in Brazil. Then he fought, what, ACB and ACA? Isn't ACA what ACB used to be? I don't know. I'm going to have to look that up. Actually. I think they're different promotions. Anyway, he's fighting Oscar Pijota. And Pijota is coming off of a loss to Gerald Merchardt where he was submitted. And... Vieja is a much better grappler than Gerald Merchardt. Uh, I'm going to go with Vieja there. Enrique Barzola will fight Bobby Moffitt. Um, you know, Barzola had a little bit of momentum, and then he lost to Kevin Aguilar. Uh, whereas Moffitt is 1-1 one one in the UFC. Hmm. Actually, I'm going to lean towards Barzola there. Um, Cyril Gane, wow, Gane, really? Uh, okay, Cyril Gane will fight Rafael Pessoa. Uh, sorry, for those of you unfamiliar with Gane, he's a very, very decorated kickboxer. Um, I did not, I can't believe I forgot he had found, he had signed with the UFC. That is... I feel stupid about that. Because, yeah, he's... Uh, I actually think Gane is going to take that. Um, his opponent is uh, also making his UFC debut. More experienced in MMA, but... Uh, yeah, I got Gane there. Um, Tisha Torres will fight Marina Rodriguez. I don't know why I would pick against Torres here. Uh, Rodriguez is pretty good, actually. She's 11 and 0, well, with one draw. Beat Jessica Aguilar in her UFC. Not wasn't her UFC debut, rather, in her second fight. Her UFC debut was a draw with Randa Marcos. I'm gonna go with Torres there, but Rodriguez um, might be on the up and up, you know. Um, Rogerio Bontarín will fight Howley and Paiva. I. I have no dog in this fight whatsoever. Um, Paiva is, lost his UFC debut to Kai Carta France. Is that fight happening at flyweight? Or are they fighting up at bantamweight for that? No, they're at flyweight. Um, whereas Bonterin... Yeah, he beat uh, Magomed Bibluadov in his UFC debut. That was a fairly compelling fight, as I recall. Probably go with Bonterin, but eh. Um, Alex Da Silva will fight Rodrigo Vargas. Oh, has that been confirmed, actually? Yeah, okay, that's one of the ones that has been. Uh, this card, man, I'm sorry, guys. It's Again, the bout order's not finalized. We had a lot of fights, half fall throughs, stuff get replaced. Um, da Silva was defeated by Alexander Yakovlev in his UFC debut. Vargas... Uh, this is his UFC debut. I'm uh, probably going to go with Vargas, but eh, I don't know. Um, oh, here's our other good fight on this card. Gilbert Burns and Alexei Konchenko. This is a good fight. Um, Burns was supposed to fight somebody else. No, sorry. Konchenko was supposed to fight somebody else. Konchenko was supposed to fight Loriano Staropoli. Also would have been a good fight. Um, and and now Gilbert Burns is stepping in. I'm actually going to pick Konchenko there. Uh, but you know, Gilbert Burns is a lot of fun to watch fight. He's fighting at welterweight here. Must be just the short. It's got to be the short notice thing because he's normally a lightweight. Then again, he might just be moving up. We've seen plenty of guys do that. But keep your eye on that fight. That's a pretty good fight. Um, Pauliana uh, Viana and Veronica Macedo. Macedo is, I believe, 0 and 2 in the UFC. Three, geez, 0 and 3. Yeah, she lost to Ashley Evan Smith, Andrea Lee, and Jillian Robertson. She needs a win badly. Uh, Viana Owen is 1 and 2. Excuse me, 1 and 2 in the UFC. Uh, she beat. Did she beat Jeremy? Uh, not Jeremy. Uh, didn't she beat Joe Stevenson's wife? I think she did. 
Yeah, yeah. No, uh, that was that was her one UFC win. Then she's lost to JJ Aldridge and Hannah Cyphers. I'll, you know what? I'm gonna go with Macedo. That's a stupid decision, but I'm gonna do it. And we have Chris Gutierrez versus Geraldo de Freitas. Both these guys have fought in the UFC before. Gutierrez beat Ryan McDonald. He also lost to Hani Barcelos. And de Freitas uh, won his UFC debut against Felipe Colares. I actually think I recall that fight a little bit. I'm going to go with uh, de Freitas there, but now they're both you know, somewhat unknown commodities as far as that goes. Is that at welterweight or at featherweight? Excuse me, bantamweight or featherweight? Yeah. Bantamweight. Huh. Yeah, go with the free test there. Anyway, that's the card. We do Again, we do not have a full bout order finalized yet. My apologies, everyone. Uh, Jeff, is there anything kind of th- that looks good to you there that's kind of flying under the radar, maybe? Nope. Not a one, huh? <laughs> All not right. really. Hey, look, if it's not a good card on paper, it's not a good card on paper. I've... I've said it before in the past. I'll say it in the future. That's perfectly fine. I mean, I want to see the main event because I love Shevchenko. And Luke versus Perry is a decent, it's a decent enough fight, but. Yeah, if if that main event falls through, yeesh. I don't think it will, but. I don't expect it to, but just, just noting, yeesh. I mean. Hey, they're going to Uruguay. You know what? Good for the you know, good for the people of Uruguay. This, I mean, they're getting a they're getting a UFC title fight. So good for them. It's more than a bunch of states have in the United States. I mean, we can't even get a fight done in Hawaii, which well, seems like that's, a no- on, that's on Hawaii at this point, right? But I mean, like you would think it would be, you know, you think it wouldn't be so hard to get a fight done in Hawaii, you know? Again, Hawaii. In some- Roll out the red carpet because they have a dominant Hawaiian champion. It would be great for the. It would be great for like the economy and whatnot. But whatever. Uh, I mean, I, I agree it would be, but it's weird. Uh, it's ex- it is prohibitively expensive to run sporting events in the state of Hawaii. It just is. I mean, they should f- them figure it out. That would be nice. But I don't live in Hawaii. I can't vote in Hawaii. I have no say over who gets to make policy in the state of Hawaii. So, mm. Dad. Come on, Hawaii. Get it together. You're entirely too blue. Sorry. Political jokes aside. Uh, again. Oh, Robert. What? It's Look, it's been a... Hawaii's been a blue state for like the entirety of my life. Come on. I think the last time they voted, uh, actually, they might not even have been a state at that point in time, because I think the last time, no, they were. I think the last time they voted Republican was uh, Nixon's re-election. I'd have to double check that, but off the top of my head. Anyway, so that will be UFC. Uh, that will be an action this coming Saturday. I will have coverage in the MMA Zone of 411 Mania, so stop by, say hello, help me. It's going to be rough. Uh, All right. As far as news goes, let's start with uh, Cyborg. Uh, Now, is there any chance what's happening here with Cyborg and Dana White is just really tough negotiations? I doubt it. Well, Dana White did an interview that's on the UFC YouTube channel. He's out of the he says we're out of the Cyborg business. So make of that what you will. I mean, I'd argue they never actually committed to the cyborg business in the first place, but um, this was just a failed relationship to begin with. Mm. And, I, and look, there, I'm sure there's plenty of blame to go around. I, I'm, this, I'm not casting anyone as the victim or anyone as the villain, but the UFC and Chris Cyborg could never I really. See, I was surprised they ultimately got Cyborg in there. And then booked her in a title fight when they said they weren't going to book a featherweight title and then just gave her the featherweight title. And yeah, I mean, Cyborg's camp did walk back some of the stuff in the last couple days. Yeah, Cyborg came out and said that uh, some video that was posted 
on her personal YouTube channel had been uh, unfairly uh, had been tampered right. with, had been given incorrect um, caption, incorrect closed captioning. Right. And you know, I hate to. I'm gonna go ahead and say this about Dana White. He's fine doing that on occasion to his fighters, but boy, he's not happy when it's done to him. Um, I think WWE needs to capitalize on this. And why is no one else pointing this out? Uh, I mean, feel free. Make your case. Well, well look. Uh, Cyborg has talked about wanting to go to WWE for quite a while. She's had these little Twitter spats with all the WWE superstars. WWE made a play for Ronda Rousey. They signed Ronda Rousey. Signed Cyborg. You don't have to make her a regular performer. And you can... I'm sure you can teach her to do... Like a couple matches that... Don't have to be a big deal. And she doesn't need to work 15-20 minute matches either. And if you could somehow put together a Ronda Rousey versus Cyborg match at WrestleMania, you're going to tell me that like people wouldn't flock like that, um, like never before. You would get like the whole MMA media into that. People would go nuts for it. And you're telling me that wouldn't happen. I'm I'm with you. I'm fairly sure that would be what happened. I think. Because if the UFC did this, like they could be like a fight that was a fight that's 10 years in the making, a fight that we never thought we would see. And it's happening at WrestleMania. Because, look, Ronda's out of the picture right now, but she's not necessarily out for good. And I'm sure what given the right amount of time, the right amount of money, they could put this match together and, and re- at WrestleMania. Because Cyborg has been talking about this for a long time. Because look, Cyborg isn't a young woman anymore. And I mean, she's not old, but this this could be a way for her to make money without the risk of her getting knocked out or getting a limb torn off. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I I am also sure for the right right amount of money, Cyborg and Ronda can work together. I have no doubt of that. No doubt. I suppose the only real question becomes whether or not the amount of money necessary to make them play nice makes uh, how much of that will, whether or not it's viable, makes things financially viable. It's, it's very viable. It's very viable. I don't know. I don't know how much either of them would Robert, take. The media attention this would get would be insane. I mean, sure, in some respects, but on the other hand, how much how much extra are you going to garner from it kind of thing? I mean, that's for the the number crunchers and being which is, to put it. Which out. is also where we get okay. I mean, so, at what point is it finan- Is it no longer fin- all that financially they made, viable? They made the women's match the main event for WrestleMania, so obviously there had to be some strong belief that that would have been financially viable as a main event. Correct. Uh, WrestleMania. At this point, you could have just about anything main event okay. WrestleMania, and it's still going to okay. be fine. All right. So then, I think put this match on WrestleMania, and I think it would. It would be even bigger than the first women's main event ever. I don't think it would be bigger. I don't. I don't I think. think I don't think Ronda or Cyborg could capture the Ronda? fan base the way Becky did. Because that was that that would, could have been one of the biggest women's MMA fights in history. Yeah. Put Absolutely. it together, make it happen in WWE. The fight we never thought we'd see. It's happening at WrestleMania, and even though it's a wrestling match, it would still get a ton of interest. No, if if they can make it happen, I think it's a good plan. And if and if if they can train Cyborg, if Cyborg is a natural at it, maybe she isn't. I mean, you look, they got her. You don't have to book her every week. You can book her once every six months. You know what is wrong with that? That's Brock Lesnar's gig. I mean, why why not? If you have the the chance to do that, you know why? I mean, look, I think Chris Jericho's deal in New Japan is brilliant because you only you, you see him every few months he he comes in he challenges the champion or the intercontinental champion he has a little mini feud in that and then we don't see him again for i think that's great do something like that with cyborg 
um, in WWE, train her a bit, see if she can handle the training, see if she can work a work a match, and if she's able to do more, let her do more. Go from there. It's not I mean, rocket science. No, it's not. I mean, and if they can get Cain Velasquez to do you know, Hurricane Rana's and AAA. Yeah, they can do some. And yeah. you know what else? And Ron, even though Rhonda didn't have a, that long a run, and de- she worked a lot more than I think any of us expected. She basically had a full time schedule the time she was there. I don't know and how many did, house shows did she do. A lot of house shows. I know she did she television. Didn't do like she didn't do like every house. She did a fair number of house shows. Yes. Okay. Uh, I I genuinely don't know. Won the title. Like she she did a fairly reasonable amount of like. Like, people were even saying she wasn't a full... full yeah, she was basically a, a full-time worker the her the time she was there. I would consider that, for a wrestling... Considering how big a star she is in, in a wrestling deal, basically full-time. And that's what needs to happen here. Um, but you know what? To be honest, I'm not too sad about Cyborg leaving either. I mean, I... I like Cyborg as kind of a general rule. I don't agree. I don't agree with her on everything that she's said or done. I've, I'm not the biggest fan, but I, I do kind of generally. You can't tell me a lot of her success was not due to the fact that she was a cheater, abused steroids, and got really big. Eh, I, yeah, I kind of can't actually. I'm not going to pretend right. she didn't. I'm not going to pretend she didn't benefit in some way from that because. Performance enhancing drugs exist to enhance performance. Yeah, and she was able, but I mean, she was able to bully a lot of women that were smaller than her. Yep. You know, and hey, and Hoist Gracie made a reputation out of fighting people who had never heard the word jujitsu. Like, you do what you can with what you got. Hoist Gracie used steroids too. He did. In fact, I think all of them did. Uh, so. I hope I I mean I hope she was well compensated. I I have no ill will against her. Um, I will what, say it's kind of a shame we're not going to get the rematch with her and Nunez, even if it went exactly the same way, and it might have. Because... I mean, how important is that rematch even? I I mean, but, in what sense? I mean, I mean, I mean. The only reason we we would be getting that rematch is because. Well, one, Nunez got a surprising upset, but because it's Cyborg. You yeah. Know? It and wasn't like that was a close fight or a controversial decision. No. And, I'm, and I don't it look, the only like Cyborg earned a rematch uh, against her. You know? The only reason we got Nunez and Rousey was because it was Ronda. Like, sure, that's true, but it also didn't stop it from happening. I mean, Cyborg barely even had competition in her weight class. 145, and and here's another thing, Robert. 145 was a division that had to be created to accommodate Cyborg and Gina Carano. Yeah. They couldn't make, because they couldn't make Bantamweight or a lower weight class. Also Um, true. And the field at 145... Yes, there are women at one women's featherweight, but it, it, it's very thin. It is. Aren't that many. And, yeah, Felicia Spencer did better than we expected, but she still lost that fight. I mean... Who- I, I genuinely think about the third best featherweight on the women's side in the world is not in the UFC. And who is that? Uh, Julia Budd. She's Bellator's featherweight champion. Okay. Do you think Julia Bubb would even do that while in the UFC if they picked her up? Um, I, I mean, again, we're talking about women's featherweight, so yeah. <laughs> I and think her she's... biggest win is probably Marlous Coonan. Again, she, yeah, again, you fight who you can, de- you, depending oh, on the Julia circumstances. Bud got submitted by Ronda in Strike Force too. Yeah, they fought. <sighs> well, remember, Ronda started at fl- Ronda started at featherweight. Right. It wasn't until later. She- it wasn't until the Tate fight, I think, that she actually cut down. I mean, I'm not saying Cyborg was a bad fighter, but I'm saying Cyborg was able to exploit 
the thinness of her division and the lack of strong contenders and and that she was a cheater. Yeah. I'll I'll agree if to the first. You get upset one. at me for bringing uh, you know for bringing up the cheating. It's documented on record. Okay, if you're going to say that, then you have to discount every fight that took place pre USADA because everyone. I mean, no, I and don't. Ha- and she, half of them post USADA because she failed pre USADA, Robert. I know. Uh, look, here's my point. If you're and she had issues post USADA. And she had one issue that was documented to be a next term, uh, something different. Look, I'm not saying the woman never took anything. That's not my point. Okay. My point is, if you're going to talk about her as a you know, contemporarily with everyone else, you want to really want to try and tell me that Misha Tate never juiced? You want to try and tell me that Ronda never took anything? I mean, I... I mean, there's no the only, look. The only thing you I know you can't no, prove. No, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. You no can't. Evidence. You can't prove the negative. I know. And we, so we all just kind of have to go along with the notion that all right, we all know everyone was on. So Ronda had a very long career in combat. She was an Olympic athlete, sure. so we know she got tested by the Olympic Committee. Sure. And I don't know how great. I mean. We would assume they have a pretty stringent drug testing program, correct? And you'd think, but I mean, she dealt with that, and she dealt with um, the USADA era as br- as briefly as she had to. She still dealt with it and never had any issues there, and neither did Misha. Okay, I'm not saying they never. My again, here's my point is not that they failed tests. My point is they were they existed under a circumstance where testing was so bad everyone was on something. Okay. So we do we so how how much of that are we going to discount? I mean, I'm happy to throw I'll, Matt I'll, Hughes I'll, out the I'll window. Women, Cyborg is the only one who, who who is a documented drug test is a documented drug too. So I mean, look, I'm happy to throw, you know, Sean Shirk and Matt Hughes out the window, too. Because there's no way, no way. I mean, those look, guys we, know, we know Hughes, we do know Hughes uh, was was uh, one of the TRT users, correct? The he, probably, he probably had an exemption at some point. Yeah, he had a documented exemption. But my point is... I mean, look, everyone... Look, with Cyborg, it's factual, it's documented. Yeah, she had a failed drug test. And people liked it, and people liked it, but people still like to sweep it under the rug, and that bothers me. I'm happy to mention... I'm happy to say it, she failed a drug test. Because, look, because, look, after... When Chael Sonnen, when he had his random, random testing failures, people wanted blood, and people demanded he get fired by Fox Sports and UFC, and they did. And I kind of feel, honestly, I kind of feel Cyborg got off easy with her thing. Well, look, there's all, there's all, this is also the issue, if you want to get into it, where there's degree of failure. Sure. I mean, look, Cyborg's failure in the UFC, she fought, she documented that it, they were able to prove, uh, uh, whatever they were trying to prove, I forget the specifics of it. Forgive me. Honestly, I think she got off light with her last kind of issue. There, I oh, her very full. Free. Yeah, every everyone got off with exactly what she got off with in that era. If not, you failed not, a drug not test, Machida? not Machida. No, 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 Ma, no, no, no. Machida's. Uh, oh, sorry, I thought you meant the first one, like the one in Strike Force kind of thing. No, I mean, I mean her second thing with under the. Okay, so if we're just talking about USADA, USADA sucks. All right. Fair enough. I think she got off easy with that because, and I even said at the time, based, because, on, the criteria, based on the criteria of a Pope, like a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a, po- like a post-TUE, like after the fact. Retroactive. A retroactive TUE. She did not. I do not believe she fit the criteria, based on what on on the on the language that was on Usado's website. I don't. Yeah. 
Because you I suck. First stun, I, I feel like she should have been punished for that, at least. But, because, well, look, USADA sucks. They do not equitably, okay. they, they're not as a-scientific as your average state athletic well, commission. Well, my point morons. is, they granted her a retroactive TUE for that, for what I felt was a an indiscretion where she was at least partially at fault. Okay? Okay. And they, I feel like she got off easy there. And okay. I don't think, I, and I, I don't feel like it's wrong to bring it up when it comes to Cyborg. I'm sorry. I don't think it is. Look, if you want to, you can. That's up to you. Look, and Amanda Nunes, say what you want about her, but she's fought consistently and beaten people consistently in the USADA era, other than maybe that one controversial win over Valentina. Where she has not had any issues either. So, so far. So far. So. I mean, look, I've said this before. Look, there, there's, I cannot deny that there are probably techniques that USADA isn't even aware of. So there could be active cheaters right now. No, no, no. Are, there are. are I, would, watching I watching. would bet my life. You could put a loaded gun to my head. Yeah. But I can, but but look, this is just based on facts and what we actually know, and based on the facts and what we actually know, Cyborg is a documented cheater. Right. I don't, and I don't think it's sexist. I don't think it's wrong to bring that up. I'm sorry. That's fair. Look, I, I don't think you're sexist. Your, category, you're your categories with me. The cat me out after I said that. Yes, Jeffrey, you're right. You don't want that cat to agree with you. I want the cat to agree. That is, Thank you. that is, Thank that you, is, Pitty. that is not a ringing endorsement of your position. Okay. Trust me, you I don't like know that. Cats. I like cats, and I'm happy for the cat to take my side. I'm just saying. Look, I like this cat. He's big. He's old, but he's. He has a, ni- he has a nice sounding meow. He has a good, healthy meow. Yeah, he's healthy. He's just old and. Kind of a pain in the butt and a bit of a dick, but he's a cat. That kind of comes with the territory. Does he scratch a lot? Does he? Does he hurt you? No, he just does what cats do. You know, like, oh hey, let me <laughs> meow at the let me what meow at this door. door. Okay, I'll open the door for you. And then, no, I don't actually want to go through the door. No, cats, you cats cats are high maintenance. They kind of like to do whatever they want. You know. Hey, look, look, I'm not di- I'm not trying to knock cats as a species, but they're kind of dicks. And that's just part of the that's just part of the buy-in when you have a cat. Yeah. You're gonna get jerked around but, on occasion. But some people are like that, and that works for them. Also true. Some some people and some people just like high maintenance animals that take a lot of work. And I don't think I don't think there's any I don't think there's anything wrong with that. There isn't. If you again, I don't have anything against yeah, cats. Yes, I know that if you were dying of thirst. A cat would not give you the sweat off of its balls. Cats don't sweat. <laughs> it's a metaphor. Okay. If if you if you were to die in a cat's presence, they probably would not even wait four days to start eating out your eyeballs. Oh no, you, the eyes go bad long before that. <laughs> anyway, with that if, on that morbid the cat, note, if you if it was you or the cat, it's like the cat's picking itself. Every yeah. time. Every time. So, anyway, moving on. Uh, what else? What else happened this week? I thought it was funny when John Jones said Robbie Lawler let America down. <laughs> that was funny. Look, can I just like the ball? Like, I mean, I'm, I kind of respect the balls on John Jones. Like, man, just do. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I mean, look, Ben Askren's response was probably the best. Uh, he, uh, he came what out. Did Askren, what did Ben Askren say? He said, "I'm sorry again that I lost because now you'll all have to listen to Colby and Kamaru talk first. <laughs> talk in the build-up to their fight. I mean, and he's not wrong. <laughs> I mean, I don't see how Askren is much worse. Askren's at least Askren engaging. Askren does the same thing. No, no, no. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Thinks that a- Covington does. He just does it. Does it with less." M-A-G-A Trump supporter stuff. Uh, look, Askren's, Askren's a lot cleverer than Colby when it comes to that stuff, and Askren's a lot more engaging when it comes to that stuff. 
And, and Askren follows a very similar playbook. I'm sorry. Sure. No, no. Uh, look, my, I, I think this, I believe the substance of his point wasn't, I wouldn't talk a boatload of crap. Mm-hmm. It's that I, it's that mine wouldn't be this cringy and you could actually engage with it. I did. I did think it was uh, funny when Co- one of Covington's line I thought was funny. He called Lawler the UFC champion, the Ultimate Feelings champion. <laughs> Considering how sociopathic Lawler is, that is funny. Where he now, I don't know how truthful this is. I'm sure you know there's two sides to this, but. I think he was saying that Lawler, he was he was putting forth the idea that Lawler left American Top Team. I believe he said this on uh, Ariel Hawani's ESPN show, that the reason Lawler left uh, American Top Team was because he was upset that they put Woodley's like picture in the gym or something after Woodley won the belt from him. Yeah, I think Lawler's refuted that, but yeah, that has been Colby's stance. Um. Because my, as far as I know, Woodley wasn't even that heavily training an American Top Team when he fought Lawler. Like I was always hearing about Woodley training with um, Duke Rufus and Rufus Sport. I can't remember when that shift took place. I recall it happened before he fought for the title. I again, I could, I can't remember off the top of my head when he made that move. I'd have so. to like look back at the timeline, but. He started. He did start training a lot with Duke Rufus, and, le- and it's yeah. Seemed- that's where he. I believe that's where he trains out of now. Because he wasn't. Tra- he wasn't training at the same gym as Lawler when they fought. You know. No. Um. <laughs> UFC pre- the UFC 240 did 722,000 viewers on ESPN. Oh, ESPN uh, Plus. No, the, were these on? No, these were on ES regular ESPN for UFC 240. Oh, the prelims, excuse me. Prelims, prelims. I, I misheard you. Uh, peak was 883,000 for Arajo versus Davis. Da, 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 da. UFC 237. So normally, I th- I think I'm reading normally they do higher. But like they did eight hundred nineteen thousand for UFC two thirty. I don't know if these. I don't know if these are good or really bad for ESPN. But whatever. So these are the numbers that came out in the last week. Uh, ABC passes rule alteration to definition of grounded fighter. This seems interesting. Oh, what, hang on. Which one? This. Um, Oh, the American Boxing Commission. Yeah, the committee. Yeah, unit yeah, yeah. I know. Famously passed an alteration of its rule. On the definition of a grounded fighter, according to a report by ESPN that was later confirmed by the ABC, under the new language, a fighter is considered grounded if they have anything more than just the soles of their feet on the mat. Thus, a fighter who has a fist or palm on the ground will be considered grounded and cannot be attacked. Um, I don't really know if I like this, Robert. That's the old rule. The... uh Again, some of this okay. is only a fighter's fingers be touching the mat. That will not be grounded. Eh. It still seems kind of vague, if you ask me. It is, and the fact that we can't get on board with, and I mean, the ABC doesn't actually have any authority either. And I remember a fight before this, like we had like the updated rules, but we didn't have instant replay or something. Uh, Vegas, I believe, operates that way. I mean, I don't like this. It should be one set of rules everywhere. Is what it should be. That would be nice. We shouldn't have different different rules for different states, different countries, for the same organization. I'm sorry. It needs to be one unified set of rules. I mean, I mean to call this even the unified rules is is a bit of a misnomer, is it not? Entirely. So, yeah, that bothers me. Um, were there any major fight announcements? Um, let me see. I don't think we had anything major. Billy Robertson versus Macy Barber at UFC Boston. Yeah, I don't recall any really major fight announcements. Marina Moroz is out of the fight with Pagliano uh, Botelho at UFC 241. 
So thankfully, uh, Cormier versus Miocic is still intact for right now. Oh, here yeah. we go. Okay. Not confirmed, but Derek Lewis versus uh, Blagoy Ivanov uh, in the works for UFC 244. From, this is from MMA Fighting. Yeah, I remember seeing that they were looking to go that way with that. I feel and... like Lewis is kind of peak, but, you know, he'll still get fights and whatnot. He's popular. Yeah, I mean, he's an engaging character, if nothing else, and it's heavyweight. I mean, apparently he made out, I mean, he, I mean, he, even in a losing effort against Cormier, everything it sounded like he made out very well for that fight. So unless he's blowing his money on just like, um, expensive cars, like he should be living fairly comfortably now. Like he got a, he got like a Popeye's sponsorship and like free Popeye's for life. So at the very least he can feed his entire family on Popeye's for an indeterminate, an indeterminate. Depending on how they, depending <laughs> on the definition of free for life, because there's usually caps on that. Well, but like free for life constitutes one, you know, one free meal a day, right? Kind of thing. Um, I don't think there's been any major fight announcements over the last little bit. It, I mean, as far as it is, it's a decent heavyweight contest. I mean, it'll probably suck, but it's heavyweight, you know. I, I enjoy Lewis as a fighter. He's you know? a fun. He's a fun character, and his fights. He's only. I think he's only had like two that really sucked. But I like that Lewis will make these just bizarre, come from behind performances in the last round. He has a habit of doing. <gasps> Yeah, he does tend to. He he's pulled out a few of those in the past. Uh, Melissa Gatto failed a uh, drug test for a diuretic. Eh. So who does uh, Amanda Nunes fight next? Now that it looks like the cyborg rematch is not happening. Oh. It's not a very competitive field at women's bantamweight right now. You know. No, it is not. I mean, her. Be- I I think the best contender, in terms of like you know skill, who might have a chance at beating her, very very slim chance, and I wouldn't pick her, but it is probably Ketlin Vieja. Well, but she's been so she's been so inactive that I don't even know if you can make that fight. Like she has the best win streak right now, and she's undefeated. I feel like she would ne- have to win like at least one more and then I mean, she, her last fight was what the Sarah McMahon fight uh I think it was Kat Zingano okay even longer then yeah uh and that was last year yeah, uh, she's like she's eight. been out for a while and I mean Holly like I like Holly but she's 37 uh, you cannot do that immediately I mean they already fought like they just fought you can't there's no well, reason for like, immediate what rematch what if Aha were to fight Holly. That makes sense. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't be against that, but I mean, how many, realistically, how many fights do you think Holly Holm even has less left for her career? As far as in the UFC, I don't know. It's hard, it's uh, hard for me to foresee that, but it doesn't seem, I can't really I, see her I, having I, fights left, just overall. I don't, I'd have a really hard time seeing the UFC keeping her around for another, if she's around in two years, I'll be shocked. Um, let's see now. What's going on with Juliana Pena? Um, she won her comeback fight recently, but Pena won in July. Maybe Pena can fight uh, Vieja. You know? Yeah, that's you know that might be an option. Yeah, there's a few options there. I mean, if you're gonna do her at if you're gonna do if she is going to fight at featherweight. There's not a lot. It's kind of slim pickings at Bantamweight right now. I mean, at all of them. Like, the only genuinely robust women's division right now is strawweight. Yeah. All the others are... Bantamweight's in a really awkward spot. Flyweight at least... I mean, flyweight at least has the excuse that it's relatively new. Featherweight has... No, featherweight has nobody. There's just no rankings in for featherweight. Nope. 
Oh my god. Like, can we just fold the division already? Come on. I would. I mean, look, we had it for a bit. If if it comes back, if they you know, had in a few it, and years, they had it because of Cyborg. To, yeah, you to, ha- to appease Cyborg, basically. Look, you had it because you had a novelty act in Cyborg, and you wanted to make the most of that. Fair enough. If you don't have that anymore, and there's not actually a division there, fold it. You know, if you get to a point where there's enough talented bodies to supply a division, then you can reintroduce it. Yeah. But, like, there, there's nothing that Isn't says... That what happened with, with Lightweight, even though I, I don't think it was called Lightweight at first? Yeah, uh, the UFC Lightweight. Because they folded it at, they basically folded it after um, Gomi and BJ Penn, I think, fought to a draw. Excuse me, not Gomi. Crap. Was it was it Penn versus Pulver? Was it Pulver? No, 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 no. Because um, Pulver left the UFC, I think, after he beat Penn. Okay. I believe it was the rematch between BJ Penn and Kaul Uno that went to uh, a draw. Because uh, uh. that was supposed to crown. Yeah. Had, new yeah, Gomi hadn't fought in the UFC by that point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, again, uh, my mistake. It wasn't Gomi. BJ Penn did beat Gomi, though. They fought once, and he choked him out. Right, right. Uh, no, it was Uno, and they were supposed to fight. That was going to be for the belt, and they were just crowning a new champion, and they fought to a draw, and the UFC said, screw it, and then waited like three years, and then waited, you know, three or yeah, four I years, and then brought it back. I think it's time to say screw it right now. Yeah, I don't think there's I don't think there's enough interest. I don't think there's enough talent. I don't think there's enough bodies. Now, hypothetically, let's say like Bellator were to go under next week and UFC wanted to acquire that whole featherweight division, then I would re- You could re- make you could maybe make that work or at least try it for another year or so. You might have a, you that's, would at that point you would have enough. That's a work. hypothetical scenario though, you know? Yeah, I, I, they would need a pretty significant influx of actual talent. Who's going to stay in the division, not a bunch of blown up bantamweights. And I think there are some good women's featherweight fighters out there. I'm just not sure there's enough to sustain a whole division right now. If you could get all of them in one place, I think there is. But they're all kind of dispersed. Right. Yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't think there's really too much else this week, to be honest. No, there again, there wasn't a whole lot apart. Again, like the big thing was the UFC officially kind of parting ways with Cyborg. Okay, incidentally, just very quickly, do you think Cyborg ends up? I know you're you made your pitch for the for WWE, and I think you're correct. I think that's a good idea. If she stays in the MMA field, do you think Bellator or PFL is more likely? I think Bellator because of the Scott Coker. Uh, association. It just depends on how much Bellator is willing to pay her and how much Cyborg wants. It's a shame we won't get her and uh, Kayla Harrison because that would be... Oh yeah, I don't think she's going to PFL. No, I mean look, PFL is in some respects very dubiously managed to begin with, but... (laughs) Um, They're also on ESPN Plus. I mean, how much money is uh, are 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 the big fighters in Bellator making big money? Do we even know? I couldn't tell you. They are, but uh, could they offer Cy- Could they offer Cyborg even more than the UFC? Is what I mean. I mean. They could offer her more than, I mean, certainly now, because the UFC just isn't going to give her anything. If you I mean kind of like generally. If Vince, McMahon, if you're Vince McMahon and you're opening up your pocketbooks for all these guys to keep them out of belt, um, a- AEW, you want to open up the pocketbook for Cyborg. You definitely want to do that. I'm sorry. Uh, just for the possibility that you can someday hopefully book Ronda Rousey versus Cyborg at WrestleMania. Uh, again, it's a thought, and I, if they can make it work, it'll be nice. I'm, I'm not sure how realistic it is, but... I mean, I feel like if WWE can make Edge versus Matt Hardy work in the middle of that whole thing, I don't see how they couldn't You're make. also dealing with two people who came up in the professional wrestling business and kind of knew how to leave business and leave out how to be professionals. Ronda and Cyborg Ronda's come from... Ronda's an Olympic athlete. Yeah, a competitive Olympic athlete. 
So there's a world of difference coming from an era from a comp from a mindset of competition. I have especially against people you Vince really could, don't like. Vince could not sit these two women down in a room and just say, "Let's ha- let's hash it all out right here." I don't think they would be in the same room. Whatever. Let's hash it all out. Let's work it out. We want you to. We want to make this happen for the fans, and we want, and we're going to pay you a a crap load of money. I feel like they could be convinced. I see no reason. No, I again, and, I and yeah, and yeah. Edge and Edge and Matt Hardy came up in the business, Robert. But this is still a business that's one of the most dubious businesses in the history of the world where guys are constantly backstabbing each other and manipulating one another. So, I mean, yeah, sure, I, but they it, also, but there's a, I'm sorry. I think this by comparison, I think this is a walk in the park. Who was the last person on WWE television to go into business for themselves at the expense of the guy they're in the ring with? I think Kevin Owens, probably Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn. When did they do that? Uh, there was a thing. When did they stop working and start fighting each other? Like legitimately fighting each other. I, I, you're, you, that was not your question. Your okay, question let me phrase to... it that way then. When was the last time you saw a legitimate fight on WWE uh, uh, television? I don't know. I'd have to go back and look. I mean, Kurt Angle said he, he purposefully stiffed John Cena. Okay, okay, you, okay, you get potatoes. That's not the same thing. Because uh, if Ronda stiffs Cyborg and Cyborg decides to punch Ronda in the face as hard as she can, that's it. Um, we're getting an actual well, fight. I mean, there were some times in, uh, I think, the Lesnar versus... There was a thing in the Lesnar versus Strowman match, I think, at a Royal Rumble where they were... Uh, uh, again, you get you got a moment where they kind of... There was a bit of miscommunication. Somebody got stiffed. Somebody gave him a receipt. But you didn't have to stop I, I don't the see match. How that, I, don't see, I don't see how a receipt is more acceptable. Because it's, it, it doesn't break the continuity of the story. Okay. Uh, again, I'm, if I'm, Lesnar if Lesnar is legitimately taking a shot at a guy direct to his head after he got kneed in the face, right? But, uh, but but he's doing it on purpose. I don't see why that's better. I, I mean, again, there's better, and then there's what we can accept on television. Okay, but that was Brock Lesnar, and he got no heat for that. So, I again. Well, ne- I mean, neither did Brock. You, have, you definitely have to lay down the law and 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 be firm about this. But to me, the benefits far outweigh the drawbacks. Uh, again, especially if you put them on WrestleMania, and somebody decide, and you know, Ronda decides, you know what? No, I'm just going to tear your arm off. Or Cyborg decides, no, I really, you know, we don't, Look, I really man, don't like you. I'm just going to genuinely knock you out. Not go into business for themselves. They did not, or uh, or rather than that, they did not try to kill each other. You're again. You're also <laughs> dealing with people who fundamentally hurt, understand the nature of the business and come from that, that background. Shawn Michaels. Other than other than the the screw job, they kept they kept it all backstage. Yeah, yeah, because they bought. They also buy into the cult of wrestling thinking. Okay. I don't think Ronda or Cyborg do. I don't. I don't see how they could not be instructed. I'm sorry. With that much money, with that much money on the line, I feel like they could do it. And you're. And look, I would have no problem doing that, but I'm also not the type of person who's competitive Iron enough. Iron Sheik. Iron Sheik was an Olympic wrestler. And he admitted that Vern Gagne bribed him to try and break Hogan's leg and leave Madison Square Garden with the WWE Championship. Yeah, and he didn't. He didn't. And this, and and he came up from a competitive combat background, Olympic wrestler, yeah. a legitimate amateur wrestler. Yeah. So I, I I don't see how if the Iron Sheik can do that. The Iron Sheik also didn't dislike Hogan. I mean, do you know that for certain? How do you know? Because if he really disliked him and he was offered a legitimate amount of money, he'd have done it. He was offered a, I mean, he was offered a hundred thousand yeah, dollars. And it's like, well, come down here. We'll take care of you. We're going to take care of you for life. We'll give you. We're going to give you whatever you want. 
Well, and if Ganya A hadn't already burned the Iron Sheik a, a couple of times, and B, if he really disliked Hogan. How do, you, how do you know he didn't really dislike Hogan at that time? He could have. Eh, it's possible, but again, I just I doubt it. But he didn't do it because Vince McMahon gave him his big break in New York. And he, I think Iron Sheik was smart enough to realize that the bigger money, the bigger money for his career was staying there at that time, than going going along with Vern Gagne in a sinking ship, for that matter. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I feel like it's if it's about money, it's about freaking mansion land. I would work with my worst enemy if it meant a, a free ticket to Mansion Land, Robert. I'm sorry. That just means you don't actually have a worst enemy. Hmm? That just means you don't actually have a worst enemy. I mean, I mean, right now it's the ESA because they dox me and leaked all my private info online. Again, here's my, my thing about this when people say I wouldn't wish <laughs> X on my worst enemy. You that just means that? you don't have a worst enemy, man. Or you're in the... Did you hear about that? The ESA, yeah. the ESA leaked all my private info. Uh, sorry, that sucks. I hope their offices burn to the ground. I mean, I, I, I'm not hoping that. I am. But they're definitely not on. I'm definitely not on good terms with them right now for doing that, because I was on that list. Uh, they leaked two thousand. Uh, media contacts of E3 attendees, and it's all out. It was publicly on their website uh, in a file that was not protected at all. It was not password protected. So now all my all my private information, nothing financial, no credit cards, but like all my contact and my home address, it's all out there. Like if you if you search for this document, you can find all my private data and it's 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 kind of unsettling right now so i imagine but if it meant mansion land i'm going to mansion land i'm I sorry mean, it, again I, I i find that you know that again that kind of phrase i wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy that just means again you've either never been in a position to genuinely hate someone or you're too good a person to do it um because I know people, I would the worst things in my life that have happened to me. Okay. I know people that I say, I hope you go through this and more. Okay. Look, that's that's fair, but I feel I, I I just feel like Cyborg and Rhonda would be able to be convinced the writing is on the wall. Let's make this happen and let's make a ton of money. You know, like Rhonda probably doesn't have to work again a day in her life. Like she can from this, she can make enough money for like her entire family and like future generations not to have to do it. You know what I you know what I mean here, right? Come on. Eh, there's a the substance of your point is correct, even if I take issue with a few of the details. Whatever. It, look, generational wealth in the United States isn't nearly as much of a thing as people think it is. She could she could start like the Ronda Rousey from like judo promotion or that no one would pay charities, attention to. She can, well, I mean, she could start charity organizations. She can do so much. And there's a lot of stuff she could do. I'm saying, I'm saying everyone can be convinced for the right amount of money. And you know, that's true. Uh... Ted DiBiase was right. I've said it before. Ted DiBiase was right. He, in, he... in a lot, again, there is, there is a lot of truth to that. I also think there's a lot of not the, the, People tend to either believe that is too applicable or dismiss it too much. In this case, it is applicable. In all likelihood, but... I think WWE is the best option for Cyborg. Because, uh, again, she wouldn't have... I, I wouldn't... And I would... I would work it out where she wouldn't be, wor uh, like, wrestling every... Like every week, every month. You would want to use her as a very special attract a limited special attraction, basically. Unless unless she's like a wrestling savant and she wants to do it more. Then go from there. Cause 
we also have to be honest, Ronda took to wrestling very well, I think, better than we all expected. Uh, in some ways, yes. In some ways, no. All right. All right. I think we can, I think we can wrap things up for today. Yeah. I, again, there's a few things Ronda did much better than I expected her to. There's a few things that just, all right, you in really should have. In the ring, I thought she did fantastic. If you lower your expectations enough, she's fine. Okay. Uh, I mean, especially considering that she did a few of those towards the end of her run with, didn't she have uh, a broken the hand? Character stuff in the promos, that's not all on her. That, a lot of that's on WWE's booking of her. Also true. And when they turned her heel, I thought her heel term worked massively. Eh, look, Rhonda's the type of personality that initially you want to cheer, and then the more you're around her, the more you want to boo her. And right. that worked out very well in that over the course of that year right. for her. And then, and, and what did Becky Lynch do? They turned her into Conor McGregor. Her character is Conor McGregor, basically. She's the, the woman Conor, Conor McGregor. And no one can deny that. Everything she's doing is like all of her lines and promos are basically the things Conor McGregor does. And it worked out massively for Becky Lynch. That has so far, at least. So, all right. Apart from her boyfriend, because you should. Oh. Uh, ha, ha. I'm not. I don't hate Seth Rollins. I think sometimes he just puts his foot, his foot in his mouth quite a bit. I think the best description of Seth Rollins I've heard was that he's Edge before he became the rated R superstar. Um, hmm. and I think that's about accurate. Interest, interesting point. Interesting point. All right. So anyway, re- plugs. What do you got going on? Reviews this week. The number one movie in America, Hobbs and Shaw. I don't know how you feel about. I thought it, to me, it I, haven't, was, I haven't seen it yet. So it's I can't. not. A, it's it's totally ridiculous. It's totally freaking ridiculous, but it's a fun. It, it's in that it's a decent action movie. Idris Elba is a he's a goofy villain. He's a fun villain, fun banter. From a story standpoint, it still bothers me they don't address how uh, Shaw murdered Han, who was part of the family. Who cares? I care because Han sucked. I care from a story from a narrative standpoint. There's no narrative to these movies. All right. Well, to me, to me, there is. And the fact that no one acknowledges this, it bothers, it bothers me. I'm sorry. So that was my main problem with the film outside of it's totally ridiculous. Roman Reigns, they really overhyped Roman Reigns in this movie. Like he's Much like they do in his professional wrestling career. But, but Roman, but, but Roman Reigns is like, He's overexposed on TV. In this movie, he's barely in it. He doesn't even have, he does not even have a discernible line unless you count like a big, like loud grunt as a line. Good. Not a big, loud grunt as a line. No, but I also would not write lines of dialogue for Roman Reigns. <laughs> I think, I think um, uh, the director and filmmakers probably agreed with you why he did not have any spoken lines in this film. Um, Have you watched the Amazon series, The Boys, yet? Not yet. uh, One of my brothers just finished it. Another one's working their way through it. I I need to. I need to watch it because I I think I'm reviewing it. it. I I would say at least watch the first two episodes and see if you want to continue. Uh, My review of that is up. So check that out. Check out my podcast interview with Ken Shamrock. I saw that. The UFC Hall of Famer. So that is on our, our iTunes uh, 411 Wrestling Interviews uh, channel. It's on our YouTube channel, 411 Mania. Check out my exclusive interview with Ken Shamrock. And we have another one lined up this week, Robert. Guess who, who it is this week? I'm not going to guess. Well, it's a good interview. I enjoyed it with um, Selena De La Renta from MLW. She's the... Um, Valet manager. She's a wrestler. She's currently out of action due to a knee injury, but I really enjoyed this interview. She was a good interview. Uh, MLW Selena De La Renta. So, um, and hopefully some more interviews to come out. So I'm very happy, very happy about the one with Ken Shamrock. He was very, 
he was very open, talked with us for quite a bit, and uh, he he definitely seemed to enjoy the interview as well because uh, he complimented and praised it. So uh, I definitely appreciated that. Uh, we had some good stuff about Vince McMahon, Dana White, WWE, UFC. It's a little bit of everything um, in there. So, uh, and Ken Shamrock is actually still wrestling. He's wrestling in Australia for, I think, Battle championship wrestling so that was kind of under my radar but uh and uh i think he's apparently still doing um or he's it sounded like he's promoting like a, a bare knuckle fight promotion thing well, him and everybody else in that case um he made a case that the whole uh four ounce gloves things is pointless and nothing more than a facade so I don't know how you feel about that, but if you want to hear more about Ken Shamrock's views on that, please uh, go to our YouTube channel, iTunes channel, and check that check out that interview. Oh, he's calling it Valor Bare Knuckle is what he's calling it. So he definitely talked about that. So this is his new... I think this is his promotion that he's trying to do in September in uh, North Dakota called Valor bare knuckle make of that what you will so that's uh all my plugs for this week thank you robert thanks jeff all right as for myself you can listen to me mark radlich and was alexis on our last show i can't remember now uh we reviewed jeez what came out last week once upon a time in hollywood thank you Thank you. God, I don't know why I blanked so hard on that. Uh, yeah, myself, Mark Radlich, and yeah, Alexis Hayner reviewed Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Hey, it's it's not bad, but it's a deeply indulgent film for Tarantino. Very indul- very indulgent. Indulgent is almost like an understatement. Yeah. I believe, if I can quote Mark, it's an excuse for Tarantino to jizz all over the camera lens. But that's kind of his thing. Especially without his longtime editor. Would you, uh, which, agree, would you agree it was too long? I don't know. It, it, on the one hand, yes, because it's like uh, it's almost three hours. On the other hand, I'm not. I, I was thinking about it, and I'm not entirely sure what I would cut where. I'll tell so, you what I would cut: um, the wife scene with um, um, Cliff Booth and his wife. I think the movie's better without uh, that, for example. I'd have to rewatch it if I was really going to go through and go, okay, where am I cutting 20 minutes out of this movie? But we, so we talk about that. I, um, think, I mean, I mean, even cutting out 20 minutes, it's still a two hour. 20 it's still a long movie. movie. It would still be a long movie. Even if you cut out 20 minutes, that's the thing. It's a I, I genuinely movie. don't think you can get, you could cut, you know, 40 minutes out of it though. No, without, without losing cut, a lot of it. I think you, I agree, but I think you could definitely cut 20 and that's still a lot of that's still a lot of time to cut out of a movie. It is. That's a whole that that's a whole reel basically. That's just my that's just one man's opinion. Um, so, also yeah. about the feet. Did you like that's, Michael Qualley's that's, feet? That's just a Tarantino thing, man. Did you like the Did you like the feet? Eh. Did you like Dakota Fanning? Who was she? She was um, uh, the redhead. Oh, redhead in the uh, in the Manson cult. Squeaky, squeaky from yeah. Eh. Didn't clearly didn't leave much of an impression. But I will say I'm not a huge Tarantino fan. I generally like the movie, and I liked DiCaprio and Pitt's performances. Yeah, there's there's not a lot to actively dislike about the movie. Uh, so this week it'll just be Mark and I as we review uh, Hobbs and Shaw, which I haven't seen yet, but we'll be seeing on Tuesday before the review. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm not looking forward to that. See, I wasn't looking forward to it to begin with, and then I heard Ryan Reynolds is in it at some point. And I just wanted to shoot myself in the head. I can't stand Ryan Reynolds, so there's that. 
this oh uh, there was some, Mark and I as well as Victor I can't remember that gentleman's last name my apologies but three of us got together for alternative boxing coverage commentary for or a watch along for the the heavyweight fight on Fox last night um, Adam Vachorit uh, excuse me I'm I'm butchering that guy's last name and I because I can't remember what it is off the top of my head I'm um, Karnaski that's it. Uh, I believe it was Karnaski and uh, Chris Ariola. I think it's Chris. So you can listen to that if you're into boxing. Um, not a great fight. But I guarantee you we're more engaging to listen to than Deontay Wilder on commentary. So there is that. Uh, I'll be back here again. We'll be back next week to review UFC on ESPN plus 14 and preview UFC 241. Which is, you know, there's about four or five good fights on that card. And that's more than I can say about a lot of fights, about a lot of events recently. So I'll take it. And we'll get, we'll have a full preview of that. Again, the rematch between Cormier and Miocic is, uh, that's a pretty good, I mean, again, the first fight ended rather quickly, but it was a good fight for as long as it lasted. And those two match up in some very interesting ways. So we'll have a full preview of that next week. Until then, thank you all very much for listening. Thank you for subscribing, whatever your methodology of obtaining podcasts is. Thank you for interacting with the product a little bit. Be that a review. However, write a review. Uh, Give us a star rating, however much you think we deserve. If you think I deserve one star, we deserve one star here. Give me a star. Yeah, just interacting with it a little bit is always helpful. And we'll be back here next week. Until then, stay safe out there, and please continue to be well, be safe, and behave.